C'est pas trop tôt pour, euh, il pour est, la cause. Il est plutôt matinal, il est même il y a le soleil il à se lever, mais tout va bien. Parfait, merci beaucoup d'être là. Donc, René, je te présente donc, euh, essentiellement les M1 de l'école de journalisme de Sciences Po qui ont démarré avec nous le 26 août. Euh, donc, euh, ça fait cinq semaines. Oui. Donc, euh, René Caplan, c'est euh, d'abord une ancienne enseignante de l'école de journalisme de Sciences Po. Elle travaille euh, sur tous les sujets numériques, digitaux, en lien avec l'information depuis, euh, on ne va pas dire euh, combien d'années, depuis plusieurs années, voilà. Euh, elle travaillait aussi au FT euh, sur euh, tout ce qui est euh, le développement des audiences, des nouveaux formats, de l'innovation euh, digitale. Et là, elle est maintenant euh, fellow à la Neiman Lab, c'est à Harvard, pour faire un an et peut-être tu pourras partager avec les étudiantes et ta thématique de recherche et ensuite, euh, voilà, elle est basée à Londres euh, le, reste, le reste du temps avec beaucoup de séjours à Paris tout de même. Mais en tout cas, merci René hein, de te lever si tôt pour euh, parler à nos étudiants et ouais. je, te laisse, euh, je te laisse commencer. Tu peux partager ton écran si tu veux démarrer ouais. la présentation. Ouais, c'est ce que je vais faire. Par contre, je vais juste... Euh annoncer le... Enfin, un... je, le fais en... je vais le faire en anglais. Je ne sais pas. Ça va Oui. Ouais. Merci. Oui. Non, mais parce qu'effectivement, je ne savais pas si on était plutôt franco ou anglo. Donc, on va... On, va... on va être en anglais. So, hello. Um, and let me share my screen. I'm not used to Zoom, which is why I was a bit late. So, bear with me while I... Even three years into this Zoom world, I still don't quite have it right. Let's see. So I share my screen. Here we go. Share that and present. Can everyone see my screen? Uh, yeah? I can't hear you very well, so somebody show me a thumbs up. <laughs> yes, can you? I can't hear you. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Great, thank you. Terrific. So, um, hi, I am Renee, um, and this will be a little bit less of a master class than um, a little bit of a conversation about um, audience and metrics and why as young journalists you really need to care about all that anyway when really what you want to become is a fantastic compelling and maybe who even knows meaningful or, or famous journalist um so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about sort of what i do and actually how i came to do what i do um and um and then a little bit about how sort of the notion of audience and metrics fits into that at all And then a little bit actually about the ways in which that has really changed the jobs that you guys will be going out to do in a couple of years time when, when you finish studying. Um, and I'll even do a very uh, digitally forward <laughs> friendly thing, which is then um, sort of talk me through with what I think are essentially the five really important ways in which journalism and the world are going out into is probably going to be changing this year and next, um, in large part because of this focus on, um, on audience and, uh, and, and on the way that journalism now is really interacting, engaging with, being meaningful to, being paid and financed by an audience that we're getting to know better and better. So um, that's the program for the day. I will chat um, probably for about half an hour or so, um, and then just open it up to conversation and questions and, and whatever else. Um, 
So who am I exactly? And what do I do at the Financial Times? The official title of my job, which is pretty meaningless, um, as many of these roles that didn't used to exist six or seven years ago in the digital space um, are sort of insignificant until you talk about them. But I'm, I'm head of digital editorial development. Uh, that means that I'm a journalist above all um, and, uh, and was a pretty traditional journalist for, for over 15 years before I moved into a purely quote unquote digital space. But I'm also and have been for many years now a strategist. Um, and that can seem very unjournalistic and very sort of commercial or business-like, but actually to some extent, all of you are going to become strategists as journalists. Um, and we'll get into a little bit why. I'm obviously a little bit audience obsessed. Um, again, as many of you may well need to become or will become. And being audience obsessed necessarily means being data informed and deeply, deeply data focused and data infused. Um, however, I'm also equal parts content focused and content used to be a little bit of a bad word in the early days of digital when, you know, what we do as journalists is journal. We do storytelling, we do fact finding, we do social, political and democratically changing things. Content is sort of over there. Well, actually, given the nature of formats and platforms and just the diversification of the way that journalism you do um, is going to be multivaried and multimedia, it's sort of hard not to talk about content because who knows if you'll be writing or editing or recording or doing all the above as, as, you, as you produce your stories. Um, I'm also at the Financial Times um, and in all the newsrooms in which I worked and consulted, very cross-departmental in terms of actually thinking about the future of the Financial Times, which is broadly speaking what I'm doing. I'm always sort of planning ahead about how editorially speaking, the newsroom and the way we're staffed and the way we commission stories and the way we even tell and, and publish stories needs to be evolving and innovating and changing to be ready and durable, not now, but two or three or four years down the road. That's no longer something just journalists in the newsroom can do. And I'm always collaborating, not just with data analysts, or with some of our audience engagement and growth editors who are all working and journalists in the newsroom. I also work with our product departments. Some of you may know what product is, some of you may have no idea what product is. Not a single one of you when you start working is going to be able to ignore what your product colleagues do. I also work with commercial and marketing colleagues and chances are you will one day as well. And I'm also, um, and again, this used to be a taboo um, and is now integral to being a newsroom manager and a newsroom leader. I'm commercially minded. I'm always thinking not just about how we're doing and optimizing and putting ourselves in the position as a newsroom to be able to really produce and distribute and reach the, the most relevant audience possible with the most compelling journalism possible. I'm also always thinking about whether that's commercially viable and sustainable and how to make sure those things are aligned. So that's a very abstract way to describe the broad strands of what I do, which is essentially about piloting the innovation, um, piloting the innovation and, uh, and the digital strategy in the newsroom. Um, a moral school introduction, like I mentioned, I'm also a journalist um, and I was a very traditional journalist um, for almost 15 years. I started out, um, I did, uh, I'm Franco-American and I, I grew up between the US and France. I did all of my studies though, my, uh, my university and, and my graduate school in the US. And um, my first job was as a writer and then an editor for the New York Observer. 
That's a, a weekly newspaper in New York City. And, um, and then I moved to broadcast television and worked in news magazines for a news magazine show called 60 Minutes. That's on CBS News, uh, where I really focused on long form features. Um, and um, from there, I continued to produce and develop news magazine features, longer broadcast documentary features for CNN. Um, and then in 2006, I moved back to France to help launch a network that some of you may have heard of called France 24, <laughs> Saint -Gath. Um, that's a broadcast news network that, uh, that broadcasts in French and in English and in Arabic. And I came on board there as a news magazine um, producer and a rédactrice en chef as one of the launch team and, uh, and helped run and develop that and eventually became the editorial director of the English language service there. And then I left. Um, and when I left, um, digital had started to happen to the world. It had actually sort of started happening not very much longer after I got to CBS and CNN. Those were the early days of websites. Um, <laughs> but it really started to happen while I was at France 24 um, with the launch of Twitter in um, 2007, the commercial launch of Facebook at almost the same time. And the, at the, the event, just FYI, so that you get a broad sense of the timing of when this thing called audience and then much later metrics came to be something that you needed to care about. Um, that really erupted into newsrooms probably around the time of 2010. Um, does anybody know what happened um, on, uh, on your side of the world um, in 2010? Think about a really broad political movement. Um, it was the Arab Spring. And for reasons that some of you may know, that's really when digital and social media and non-traditional forms of storytelling and, uh, and sourcing erupted into newsrooms. Um, and then in, in um, about seven or eight years ago, I was called upon by the Financial Times to become their founding head of audience and insights. So I've been doing a variety of different things at the Financial Times since then. And my role has evolved as the whole universe and industry um, and development of the journalism world has changed. And it's changed radically in the seven or eight years. Um, since you guys were kids or children or still, you know, studying for your, your or high school degrees has been a period in which the acceleration of, of how journalism has changed and how your jobs have changed has been enormous. And I came on board as the first head of audience and insights there and created a digital strategy team and, um, and, and have now then grown into doing what I do today, which is a much broader role around digital strategy. Uh, just more concretely, what does that mean that I actually do when it comes to the journalism? I run essentially all of the journalism at the Financial Times that was never traditionally text. Keep in mind that obviously the Financial Times is a legacy newspaper, uh, used to be print, and it still is a print paper, although increasingly to much, much smaller numbers. By the way, just so you know, um, the Financial Times today has over a million paying subscribers. Um, only um, just under or not even 200,000 of those are print. All the rest are digital only, actually. Um, and, uh, and by far the largest part of the revenue of the Financial Times today comes from paid for digital content. So um, I run all of the journalism that never used to be traditionally text or letters on paper. I run all of our newsletters and, uh, and, and all of the different products related to newsletters. Um, I run all of our podcasts and audio, keeping in mind that audio increasingly includes things that aren't just podcasts, um, even though we're not a traditional legacy broadcast uh, media. I run all of what we call our topic verticals. So it used to be that people came to home pages and came to apps. Um, very few people do these days, actually. Nobody goes to a homepage anymore. 
People will search for a topic. They'll click through a, to a story. And we've begun creating new ways for people to find and discover our journalism that are based around topics. So things like climate change, things like cryptocurrency, things like the transformation of work, things like uh, energy or the war in Ukraine. These are all new ways that we're organizing and curating a lot of our journalism in many newsrooms. And, uh, and those take uh, whole strategies of commissioning and ways of distributing and, and broadcasting. So I run and I create and run those. Um, lots of our special digital projects. And also um, a, a through line or a fil rouge running through all of this. I'm always thinking about the monetization of, the, of this kind of journalism and content and, and working with our business on ways to innovate how it is that we can be making a lot of these now increasingly popular ways to consume Financial Times journalism increasingly more, um, more viable from a commercial perspective. So I don't need to tell any of you probably that while in France, these things are still somewhat relevant, believe it or not. It's one of the um, uh, Western countries because different economies in the global South and even in North Africa and, uh, and in Asia still have a, a slightly more print economy. Um, for the most part in Western Europe, this economy is no longer a viable one. And definitely in most Anglophone countries, it's no longer particularly viable and just a fraction of the way that people consume content. <laughs> Um, so this has gone away, and why has this gone away? Um, well, uh, a little bit because of this. Um, this may be uh, the single most disruptive force in journalism today, and um, I know some of you may not even realize what it is, and for those of you who realize what it is, you may not quite care, or it may make you laugh. This is the metaverse. And, um, and believe it or not, the metaverse may be, by the time you get your journalism degree, one of the single most significant ways in which people will actually be discovering and consuming your journalism. Um, the metaverse is an entirely virtual space that's already being massively developed for a very imminent future in which people will be spending a lot of time going to work there, buying things there, finding information and consuming journalism there, subscribing to journalism, interacting with you. This may be increasing a place where you have to think about how to publish, how to report, how to find sources, um, and how to produce in, and, and, and stories in formats that will be relevant to the metaverse. But that's not immediately where we are yet today, but that's just an illustration of how it is that you as journalists need to be thinking about, yes, you may be coming into a journalism school, hoping to be a foreign correspondent, to make a difference around certain topics to have, because you have a passion for a certain kind of storytelling, because you think it's a really important role and mission and important for, for really, the state of our democracies today, because you have a passion for writing or for producing video, whatever the reason is. But you will not ever be able to think anymore just about the kind of story you want to tell. You're going to need to be thinking about how you're going to tell your story. And mostly, where is your story going to find the audience that's most adapted for it? How are you going to reach that audience? How are you going to actually really grow and optimize the impact of your journalism and how are you going to find the audience that's most relevant for it? All of those things are now things that you need to be and will have to integrate into the thinking about your journalism before you even begin to report your story. I mean, in short, the way that we're thinking about journalism, um, what a viable media has to be today has to do all sorts of things it didn't used to have to do. And as I've been saying, this completely stretches the definition of even what it means to be a journalist today or a content producer, as you may eventually wanna be calling yourselves, um, or a media entrepreneur, if you wanna start your own media, whatever it is, 
that you want to be doing in the journalism space. You're gonna to have to integrate factors, like I mentioned, um, like a business model. Um, you may end up not ever working in a major newsroom. Chances are you won't. Those jobs are few and far between. They're increasingly fewer. If you plan on working in the United States or in the UK or in any major Western European economy, um, you will know that in some of those markets, including the biggest market in the world, which is the United States, uh, journalism roles have shrunk by 20% in the past 10 years. Um, in the United States alone, there's one in five of the local newspapers that used to exist 10 years ago no longer exist. If you plan on working in France, you'll find that there's a much stronger regional journalism economy as there is in Germany than in almost any other country in Western Europe. You're very fortunate. But in other places, there are serious disruptions, um, you know, like a recession, uh, like a pandemic um, that have been quite detrimental to the media universe or other commercial disruptions like the consolidation of the news media industry. That's the case in France where there's never been, and you see it for those of you following media business, a never stronger consolidation. I mean, you know, um, Canal Plus and TF1 and a certain few people, mostly men, have been buying up a lot of news media. And that consolidation will also have an effect on the number of jobs and frankly, on the kinds of journalism you can do. These are all things that as journalists, you do need to and will have to worry about when you think about the skill set you're developing and the audiences you want to be reaching. So a couple of predictions from a woman named Amy Webb. Um, Amy Webb calls herself a futurist, but she's actually this incredibly smart person who has made some of the most compelling predictions about the direction of where news media um, is heading um, and has been heading. And um, she said that um, as the margins continue to shrink in news media, industry consolidation continues at the expense of journalistic integrity. And as I mentioned, and frankly, France may well be a case in point for those of you following the news, uh, the impartiality of certain news media arguably has been called into question in the past few years because of the consolidation of, of the media industry. News outlets are encountering competition well beyond their industry as the subscription economy matures. So increasingly news media to remain viable are having to develop subscription models. You see that with French media, but you see that in every market. But the list of companies vying for the attention and the time and the money of the audience that you're going to be trying to reach um, is now growing more and more saturated. The audiences you're gonna be competing for to read your compelling, important, strong, socially focused or democratically important journalism are the same audiences that TikTok is competing for, that Instagram is competing for, that uh, Netflix and Deezer and Spotify are competing for. More and more, the convergence of everything happening around content in people's phones are becoming audiences with which news is competing. And that's also one of the reasons why you need to think about your audience, think about where you're gonna find it and engage with it, because you're competing with a lot more than just other news media as you emerge into the, into the journalism world. But it's still a really great time to be in journalist. I don't wanna be a pessimist. I wanna be exactly the opposite. And here is why, believe it or not, it's more than ever a great time to be in the media. The, there is a real mission. There is a democratic urgency to think about how to continue to tell and produce and distribute compelling, impartial, high impact, reachable, readable, and consumable news media in the world today. And that's because of the radically transforming um, politics of the world, the way the world has become, and I don't need to tell any of you this, increasingly polarized, increasingly less democratic, 
and increasingly less certain in the directions in which it's developing from a political and social perspective. And a world in which, especially when it comes to journalism, it is increasingly more difficult for audiences to discover and to even recognize what is actually impartial and true journalism. So this is, believe it or not, one of the best reasons today. There's never been a stronger need truly from an urgent perspective of the preservation of democracy and democratic societies to become a journalist today. Um, I also think it's a really good time to be in journalism because more and more, because of the growing polarization of the world and the growing uncertainty of the world, the pandemic just being the first one, now leading to a recession, um, now leading to elections this Sunday in Brazil, um, coming up soon again in the United States, um, you know, just today and this week and next um, in, you know, in, in the Ukraine, seeing, you know, the, 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 the unforgivable and completely egregious annexation of, of certain parts of the Ukraine to add to Crimea in Russia, et cetera, et cetera. There's never been a greater demand for quality and trust. Um, these disruptions are really demanding, whether they're commercial or political, um, or even digital and technological are really demanding and creating new editorial needs in that audience that you need to be caring about. You need to be thinking about how they're finding and getting news. That's demanding new editorial products like for the metaverse that maybe didn't used to exist five years ago or frankly, five minutes ago. This is a space that you can occupy. And as the competition and the innovation accelerates, um, so does the pressure that uh, that's you know that in in the industry in the market. But with that pressure, that creates a really strong um, and and viable kind of energy and inspiration. That that is a really good moment for you. Um, there's demand. There's activity. There are new things happening. There's a lot of energy, and that's a really interesting and exciting space that you guys as young journalists can step into. Um, but fundamentally, this is what you're going to be stepping into today already as you think about and train um, and learn the skills that, that, that you'll be needing to become a journalist. It used to be enough to really think about a great story and great content, right? It used to be that content was king. That's an expression that has been an age old expression in journalism. Um, and as I mentioned, creating and producing and reporting and finding really compelling, strong, important journalism and important stories is still the core part of what you're going to be doing and need to be doing as journalists. But for better or for worse, um, the world is such that it's no longer enough actually to produce really great journalism. Now you need to always, day one, from the moment you think about what story am I going to pitch to my editor, you need to be thinking about and who is this audience or who is this story for? And how am I gonna understand that audience and where to find them and how to reach them best? And how am I going to actually have that inform the story that I'm reporting, the format that I'm reporting it in, the way that I'm publishing it and the way that I'm distributing it. So it is no longer just enough to think about content. It is perpetually, incessantly about the audience and all of the ways that you can understand the ideal intended for a target audience best in order to engage with that audience most powerfully. Obviously, for better or for worse, and I say obviously, but because at this point I imagine you know, the way to do that, the, the magic link, the strongest bond to your audience is data. And all the ways in which you can understand the audience you already are reaching, the audience you want to be reaching, how they behave, where they are, how to find them, and the ways that they're going to be consuming the stories that you're going to be producing. Hence the importance of data and metrics in newsrooms. So this, for example, um, is little screenshots of the editorial dashboard that every single journalist in the newsroom at the Financial Times has access to. And every single journalist literally looks at every day, if nothing else, to see how their stories did. Because not only, as I've been mentioning, is data and audience 
and metrics, an important way for you to understand how to reach the audience, the intended audience for your stories. Frankly, it's also how to understand the impact of your stories. What's the point of producing a great story or producing journalism or being a journalist if you're not growing and understanding how to grow the impact of your story? That's the whole point, right? You wanna be reaching the biggest audience of the relevant people possible. So you need to be understanding how that audience is and whether you're reaching them at all. So these, for example, are some of the metrics that we deliver and that every single journalist has available freely in the newsroom. Like how did the user even find your story? Was it via Google? Was it via social media? Was it through the app? Was it on mobile? Was it on desktop? Um, was it by coming straight to the website? And then for a global media, where in the world was that article read? Let's say you report on illegal gold mining in Africa. Well, where's the biggest audience for that? Is the biggest audience for that in, uh, in North Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa? Is it actually in uh, South Africa because that's where most of the mining economy is? Or is it in London and New York because that's where the stockholders of the mining industries are? Where's your biggest audience? And understanding these things is important, right? Why? Because if the, if the majority of the audience for your story is reading a story on mobile, you need to be optimizing how you're producing um, the format of that story so that it's most legible and scrollable and shareable on mobile. If most of your audience um, for stories about illegal gold mining in Sierra Leone or the Congo is actually in Johannesburg, you want to be probably publishing your story at the time when people in Johannesburg are reading your news so that it's most fresh and most discoverable. So these may seem like nuances, but when you're competing for an audience, not just with other news media, but with everything else happening on their phone, and when you really want to be thinking about all the ways in which it's easy for an audience increasingly not to find your story, you really want to be understanding how you can use these metrics, using this data, using this insight and understanding about your audience to simply make sure that the story you're doing and producing is having the strongest impact it can. Um, it also data allows you to understand who you're not reaching and maybe can be reaching better or an audience opportunity. Uh, a couple of years ago, we uh, suddenly had better access in the newsroom to the gender breakdown of our, um, of our subscribers. Believe it or not, it wasn't a question that we ever asked. And uh, we discovered that women make up only 21% of subscribers of Financial Times. That's not a lot, but that was even a smaller proportion of women than are in all of finance. Finance is like a really male industry for sure, but there are, at least in most parts of the financial industry, 35% women. We weren't even reaching that. So we realized this was, you know, just, just this small insight of finally being able to derive the gender of our subscribers made us realize that this was an opportunity and frankly also a responsibility of understanding how to reach female audiences better. And so we were able to develop a couple of, of, um, of news products that were just for a female audience. And I won't get into that here now, but just to say, you know, understanding who you're reaching, but also who you're not reaching and who could potentially be a compelling audience for your story is also a really important opportunity. Um, like I mentioned, understanding when to publish. Uh, five years ago, six years ago, the um, orange line was when we had our peak audience online. So as you can, as that, that's it, essentially our Monday to Friday, um, about 6.30 or 7 a.m., was when we had our biggest audience for all of our journalism. The blue bars was when we were publishing most of our stories, which was at the very end of the day. We were publishing most of our stories literally, literally exactly when most of our audience was not reading. So over the course of the next 18 months, we put into place what we called a broadcast schedule. So we took a very traditional broadcast <clears throat> practice 
inserted it into a print newsroom and really made people realize that actually if you want you're really great compelling difficult to report and and really hard hard to produce story to actually be read by the people who want to read it you're going to have to publish it not at 5 p.m not right before the paper used to go to print but you're going to have to publish it in the morning at 5 30 a.m before your readers actually coming online on in their mobile as they walk to work to be sitting at their desk in the financial district at 8 a.m um, to go a little bit quickly because i'm conscious of time um, conversations are changing in the newsroom it's going to be a lot of those conversations you're going to be having conversations with your editor about you know here's the story i want to produce here's why i think it's a really great story here's why i think you should let me do it here's how long it's going to take me uh, here's how i'm going to report it what do you think what's my deadline can i go do it but you're also going to be speaking to data analysts getting some sense of well actually you know this is a topic that I've never reported on before. Is there an audience for that among our subscribers? Is there an audience for that among our users on social media? Is there an audience for that among the people coming to our app or our followers in general? And, and where do I find them? Um, you're going to be speaking to growth editors or audience engagement managers, whatever they happen to be called in your newsroom to understand well, what's the best format for reaching the, those audiences? Or frankly, who do you think I should be reaching? And, and what do you think I should be optimizing for? Is it a story that is going to be most read in the morning in the US or most read um, in the Asia morning? Where regionally am I most likely to have the biggest audience for my story? You're going to be speaking to community managers who are going to help you really make sure that it reaches the broadest audience possible across all platforms. Because you might think you're producing for the website, but maybe the biggest audience for your story and your topics is actually on social media. Um, in short, these are all different roles that you also might be doing. Maybe you won't be a traditional reporter, foreign correspondent. Those are inspiring roles and they exist and they're important and they'll continue to exist. But there are all sorts of different roles that didn't used to exist just five or six years ago or just two or three years ago that are very now common roles in newsrooms, interesting roles that need journalists like you to be working on them, to be thinking about integrating the storytelling with these new skill sets that really are deeply imbricated and, uh, and interwoven with thinking about audiences and data and metrics. But fundamentally, um, you all need to be obsessed with your audience. You need to be obsessed with your user. User is not a bad word anymore. And user is probably a more relevant word because again, you don't know how, how someone's gonna be consuming your audience. Will they, your story, excuse me. Will they be reading it? Will they be watching it? Will they be listening to it? Chances are they might wanna do all of the above, but maybe they'll, start reading it, or maybe they'll start listening to it in the morning on Alexa or on their smart speakers or on their phone or on their ear pods while they're making their coffee or running to the Metro. And then maybe they'll wanna continue that story, but scrolling through it um, in text form on their phone uh, as they ride the Metro or on their screen once they get to work. But maybe they won't actually finish it and they'll want to send it to themselves via email um, so that they can actually have access to it in their email on the way home. Or maybe they're going to want to send it to a friend on WhatsApp and they'll send it to themselves while, uh, while they're at it as well. And they'll want to scroll through it on their phone later on. Thinking multimedia and thinking not just reader or viewer and listener, but user and how your story may actually end up being multi-format de facto anyway, is probably the most important way to think about the future of storytelling. So um, finally, quickly, I'm gonna run through um, sort of five different opportunities that this focus, and it's an obsessive, relentless, and important focus on the user is actually presenting to you potentially as young journalists, um, whether it's new ways of working, new ways of being in a newsroom 
or new products actually that you could actually be thinking about working on. Um, the first is that for better or for worse, news is gonna have to be useful and it's gonna have to be easy to use. If you are producing a story that's not easy to scroll through, easy to share, probably easy to listen to, then it may not be consumed. Utility and facility of use, even when it comes to the news is going to be important because everything else happening in someone's phone is going to be user-friendly. Voice and personality are increasingly going to be ways in which journalism and important journalism is going to be distributed. Most of you spend a lot of time with earphones in your ears, whether it's pods or phones or streaming through Bluetooth on smart speakers, but streaming and audio are going to become increasingly more important. We're heading towards a hands-free future in which audio has never been more important. We're also heading towards a future in which independent journalists, in which newsrooms no longer play a role in their career, in which they remain freelance their whole careers because they either used to have a job and don't, or because they left newsrooms and now are become independent journalists, are gonna become increasingly something that you will be doing. And personalities and, and, and in thinking of yourselves, and again, for better, for worse, as news media reporter brands is going to become increasingly important. Also thinking about the fact that you need to produce news that's worth paying for. May not be your problem right now, but it might be your problem if you're an independent journalist. And there's not going to be much of an economy in five years time for news that's not an economy that gets paid for to some extent by users. Also thinking topic first um, is going to become important. Like I mentioned, homepages are for the most part a thing of the past. France is a little bit of the exception to the rule. The Financial Times is the exception to the rule. People still go to those homepages in those countries that, for that media. That's no longer happening. People search for news by story, by topic, in Google, on social. That's how they share it. That's how they get it on TikTok, in Instagram, um, through WhatsApp, through Telegram, through a million ways and on different apps that I'm probably not even aware of today that you might be aware of. And it's story first and topic first. And again, one more thing to think about, platforms like Spotify and Amazon and Apple News are starting to produce and possibly become pretty good at doing news. Is that, are those places where you might be working or competing with in the future? Um, friendly news you can use. Um, it might not be service journalism per se, like this uh, very popular app and newsletter called the Listings Project in the US, which is basically dedicated just to posting apartment listings and distributed listings. But because it's a newsletter that's become so wildly popular around listings for apartments, it's also become a way to distribute local news. As I mentioned, local news is disappearing. Local news media is dying. There's no more, there's no longer an economy for it to support in the US, but it's being reinvented coupled up with service journalism and service products. They're helping to finance the news piece of it. But also there's a different kind of service journalism and useful journalism, um, even for the Financial Times, where we will never be a media that will produce service journalism, like how do I know what Metro lines are striking today? But we, will, we all as news media produce some form of useful journalism. And for example, we produced on the back of the pot of the of the pandemic a new podcast, one of our most successful, about all the ways in which the working world has been massively disrupted by the pandemic and everything you need to know and can use as someone going back into the workplace. So thinking about useful journalism or how to make your journalism useful will be incredibly relevant when you think about users. Um, Producing journalism that's worth paying for, or at least giving people a feeling that it's worth paying for. Again, it may not be your problem as reporters, but you may not be a reporter. You may end up doing other things in the newsroom, or you may end up being an independent journalist who needs to be thinking about revenue, 
who may be producing a newsletter on Substack or a podcast for um, a podcast platform where you're going to have to think about monetizing your own content. How are you going to be thinking about really producing something that's worth paying for, worth an audience actually giving you $5 a month or five euros a month? Um, some traditional publications are thinking about that too. One of my favorite from last year, the New York Times launched what they called, um, this is the upper right-hand corner, a pop-up newsletter um, where they had rock stars like Tom Morello, who's um, both a political activist and a guitarist for Rage Against the Machine. You may never have heard of that band, but I've heard of that band. Um, it may be a Gen X band. They're really famous. He became very active politically um, in the Trump age. And he briefly wrote um, a newsletter for the New York Times once a week for six weeks. And this was an exclusive product that you got when you subscribed um, and uh, you got a cut rate subscription um, if you subscribe to that newsletter or it became part of what you got included in your subscription. So in short, that, that was a really unique, very special customized product um, that was produced just for people who are paying for the news. But it was really cool. It was really personal. Um, you may want to be thinking about that as a future journalist. How do, I, how do I create products like that, that give people something, a sense of uniqueness and differentiation and really worth paying for? Brick House, I encourage you all to go check it out. It's a really cool consortium of small local media just for New York City and just for Brooklyn. Brooklyn, believe it or not, is a massive audience of very, very news friendly people. But there's probably not any one audience big enough to support any one media. So four or five media grouped together across different topics and different functions. One is about political news. One is about culture and the arts. One is uh, focused on African-American audiences into this consortium called Brick House. And as a user, you can subscribe to all the publications in Brick House. It's really inexpensive, but in short, it's a really clever way to be thinking about how to regroup regionally relevant journalism under different topics, focused each of them on different audiences, but under one way that commercially speaking supports itself. So again, that's a different kind of product, but it's thinking about audiences and how audiences might find your journalism. Number three, voice and personality. Um, in the past two years, the number of podcasts in Apple podcast has gone from 750,000 to over a million. <clears throat> News, newsletters and audiences for newsletters have just exploded. You may one day, not that far away, when, when you go out into the journalism world, maybe you'll become a newsletter journalist. You may never write a news story. Maybe you'll only ever publish to email. That's actually a viable way to think about distribution. In any case, it's an incredibly engaging form of news media. It's become one of the most powerful <laughs> products that traditional news media like the New York Times or like the Atlantic Monthly, that you can see that in the middle, a really well-known um, news magazine in the US, um, is producing to engage and, and retain subscribers. Um, last year, the Atlantic, this was um, actually just last, uh, last autumn, launched nine new newsletters um, by personalities that people knew, but also on topics that they knew that their audience wanted to be focused on. You may wanna think about actually, how do I develop my voice for newsletters? How is newsletter journalism differently, different? How, how do newsletters help me actually engage with and reach and understand more about my audience? And what are the metrics that I can use to help me really become um, really engaged with my audience? In short, thinking about ways in which different products and, and understanding how new products may be a new format and a new opportunity for you is important. Because what we're calling the creator economy is this new economy that people like Scott Galloway an incredibly well-known, I have to say, media brand in the US, who is both a professor at NYU, but also a journalist who briefly had a show on CNN Plus before CNN Plus went away, who is also um, 
writes a very well-known and highly distributed newsletter for millions, but who also runs um, an events business. He's the classic multimedia creator of his own journalism brand. We're calling this the creator economy and it's a growing economy in which again, is both a product of the fact that newsrooms are disappearing, but also a product of the fact that maybe when you go out into the journalism world, maybe you don't wanna work for Le Monde or the New York Times or the Financial Times. Maybe you wanna work for yourself. And there are increasingly financially viable ways to do that, but you need to be thinking about things like this. Um, as I mentioned, topic first is increasingly the way users and audiences are finding journalism. Um, the New York Times created an app just for recipes and content around cooking. It's hugely successful. At the Financial Times, um, we've created, and this is one of the things that I've created, um, a topic vertical, a kind of homepage and newsletter just for climate, just for cryptocurrency, just for the future of work, just for well-being, just for the future. Um, we're seeing startups, even in a recession um, in the US, one of the most recent, more successful is called Puck. And it's not like a new startup. It's a startup that focuses just on four verticals or four topics. Hollywood, so media news and media business. Wall Street, so finance and, uh, and the titans of Wall Street. Silicon Valley, just tech. And DC, just political news. And topic journalism will often hand in hand, go hand in hand with voice journalism because with each of those topics and verticals, they hired one or two very famous journalists who don't publish to a website. They don't publish to a news media. They publish a newsletter and they publish a podcast. Um, and you subscribe to Puck and you get access to those journalists, those products um, and those four topics. Finally, um, platforms and thinking about platforms. Uh, it used to be in a world before you were probably even thinking about journalism that we often wondered, well, are these platforms media or are they, you know, are they publishers or are they tech platforms? The reality is today that there's not a single tech platform that's not producing and thinking about news and thinking about getting and competing for news audiences because they want users to be coming to their platforms and consuming every kind of imaginable content on their platforms. And to some extent, they're producing some pretty good news. So Spotify, for example, um, bought Gimlet. That's one of the most important and well-known producers of news podcasts in the US. Um, Amazon is producing increasingly more podcasts that are focused on business news um, and cultural news and any other kind of news that you might be finding and asking Alexa for. TikTok is increasingly becoming, and I probably don't need to tell this to you guys, a place that you can not just find news and news you can use, but actual um, reported news, uh, important sort of daily news, business news, news dossiers. It's also a place where 15 and 16 year olds are getting all of their news. So five trends, and I realize I've talked a lot longer than I thought I would, that are both trends of what's happening, but also opportunities and things to think about, the ways in which you as journalists will want to be producing and maybe distributing your stories, but ways in which you, you, you realize you'll need to be thinking about where your audience is, how to find them, and how to understand where to find them in the future. So I am done talking. Are there any questions? Merci. On a le temps peut-être pour uh, one or two questions. On to raise your hand. Oui, oui. est-ce est que vous <laughs> I was wondering how the metaverse can uh, change our ways to do information. I haven't uh, understood understand much. So, can you explain it, please? Sure. Um, 
arguably you don't have to worry about it today, but you might actually have to worry about it by the time you get your degree. You know, the metaverse um, is, a, is a completely virtual world that is currently being developed. And all of us are thinking about if, if users, if your future audience is spending a lot of time interacting with colleagues in this virtual space, um, virtually, right? We don't need to go into the workplace. I'm not at Sciences Po today. I'm behind my screen. You could be at home behind your screen. And chances are most of your future audience will be interacting with you behind your screen. But they may now be interacting with you and your content and your story in a single virtual world, which is the metaverse, in which they might have a meeting with a colleague. They might actually... Um, be interacting with avatars of their editor or their fellow reporters. And then they might actually be producing a format that gets distributed in a virtual form that is also available and consumable in the metaverse. <laughs> there might even be virtual newsstands where your future user might be able to pay a virtual metaverse coin from their metaverse purse to buy your metaverse story. We don't yet know what those formats will look like, but chances are they'll be multimedia and digital. So understanding what's happening in that world and in that universe, understanding how different formats will be relevant for that are, is increasingly important because maybe that's where your audience will be. Thank you. Peut-être la, la, la structure. Oui. Pas de souci. Euh, je peux vous la poser en français. Oui, il n'y a pas de problème. Euh, <rire> je, je me demandais parce que vous parlez de vraiment cibler, euh, trouver notre audience, la cibler et ultimement créer du contenu qui va lui, qui va lui parler, qui va résonner chez eux. Mais en même temps, c'est une critique qu'on a beaucoup à fait aux, aux réseaux sociaux de dire que ça finit par faire des, des chambres d'écho, en fait, où on entend juste certains, ou certaines opinions, en fait, certaines visions du monde. Vous n'avez pas peur qu'en intégrant cette vision du monde-là dans les médias, on, on finisse par simplement, bon, mais justement, créer, euh, créer des chambres d'écho au sein même de la population et créer des nouvelles spécifiquement pour certaines portions de la population c'est une super question. Je suis vraiment très, très contente que tu l'aies posée parce qu'en fait, j'aurais peut-être dû l'évoquer, mais dès le début. C'est la question la plus fondamentale et la plus importante. Et d'ailleurs, qu'on pose presque toujours parce que c'est une super question. Euh, si, on, si on fait un sujet pour des clics parce que ça optimise les clics, bah, qu'est-ce qu'on devient bah, On devient melty, quoi. On devient n'importe quoi. On, on devient du clickbait. Mais l'idée, pardon, melty, c'est un super média qui fait des super trucs, mais qui fait aussi des trucs qu'on regarde. Et si on parle de ça, c'est un exemple qui est un peu connu dans le monde francophone. Mais, euh, mais la, la réalité, c'est que vous êtes à l'école de journalisme de Sciences Po, vous êtes hyper intelligent. Vous êtes des personnes qui êtes alertes à l'idée que, avant tout, ce qui prime, malgré tout, malgré ces disruptions, euh, malgré cet univers, euh, euh, cet écosystème des médias dont je vous ai fait un portrait qui est hyper changeant, et qui doit être réfléchi par rapport à une conscience de son audience, ce n'est pas qu'il faut être mené par la data, mené par les clics, mené par le « oula, où est-ce qu'il y a le plus grand nombre de personnes ?» Il faut en être informé. Il faut réfléchir à la pertinence de savoir. Moi, en fait, pour vraiment avoir le plus grand impact avec mon journalisme, ça m'est utile de comprendre qui est le plus à même de pouvoir en bénéficier. Où sont-ils dans quel format vont-ils le lire Pas obligatoirement pour avoir la plus grande audience que possible, mais pour vraiment optimiser l'importance et l'impact de mon sujet. Donc vraiment de se rappeler que l'équilibre, il faut qu'il soit intelligent et réfléchi. Non pas être mené par ça, mais être informé par ça. C'est un peu ça la différence. Merci. Merci infiniment, René Kaplan, de l'applaudir. Merci à vous et pardon, hein, j'ai beaucoup blablaté. Mais s'il y a d'autres questions euh, que vous auriez bien voulu poser ou vous êtes trop timide, vous n'avez pas eu le temps, euh, n'hésitez pas. Euh, Alice, euh, tu, tu peux partager sans problème euh, mon, mon mail, c'est avec plaisir. Merci infiniment, merci et bonne journée. Merci. Au revoir, bonne journée. Merci à vous. <rire> Merci.
Un petit question. Il faut qu'il se fasse remarquer. Voilà, toujours pareil. Bon déjeuner. Merci. À tout à l'heure.